Hello and welcome to part 3 of this mini-series how to build an opening repertoire. In this video I will tell you about another possible way how to get inspired and add lines to your opening repertoire. And this method is getting inspired by chess literature or a chess player. So you may have your own uh, heroes and they not necessarily need to be the best players in the world. It's difficult to emulate Carlsen or Caruana or Nepo or whoever you fancy. They have really wide repertoires, very well developed and it's not so easy to, to follow them. These, let's say, idols or, or well, people you look up to can be just more, let's say, close to you players. For example, um, I remember uh, when I was playing uh, on the circuit, I was looking at people, let's say Nikitan Mayorov, a very good friend of mine who had this very solid repertoire with white based on G3 systems. So I picked up a line or two from him. Um, so you get people who are more close to you, maybe in your own surrounding, which with whom you can exchange some um, ideas or, or just talk, talk about certain lines. Um, another way is to consult and check chess literature. And in this video, I will actually show you how I combine these two methods, uh, being inspired both by chess literature and a player, to incorporate or and at least analyze one line that I found to be to my liking. Uh, the book I used actually is the book uh, Rock Solid Chess by Sergei Tivyakov. I have known Tivyakov for many years and uh, I, I have played him several times and I know that he has very uh, compact repertoire, repertoire which is not aimed at perhaps getting an advantage but rather at getting a type of position that uh, uh, he likes. So I knew that, for example, Tivyakov always played the Alapin Sicilian against the uh, uh, well, Alapin variation against the Sicilian, and he also played the Taraj variation against the French. And in these uh, la these openings, he always strived to obtain this typical position of three against two on the queen side. So A B C pawns for white against A B for black. However, I never really paid much attention to that. I just knew about this fact. Uh, and I just uh, did my own thing. And this changed when I when I started reading his book, Rock Solid Chess. And in it, he was very uh, precise in describing uh, and explaining these positions uh, when uh, White has these three pawns against two on the queen side. So um, he showed some games, games of his, games of other players, and explained the main ideas in these positions uh, on some deeper level of understanding that I had by that point. Uh, he also explained which pieces to be exchanged, which pieces to be left on the board, in which situation. So it was really a very good level of understanding, very, which you don't normally get unless you somebody tells you these things or unless you study and play these uh, positions for a very long time so you can extrapolate them and understand them yourself. So after exp they, he explained all these things, I said, hmm, well, these positions are not that bad, actually. I can perhaps play them myself. And the first thing to do is to try to find lines that can lead you to these positions. Therefore, the first step uh, for me was to explore uh, and, and to actually do a practical thing, which was to check the Alapin variation against the Sicilian defense. So E4, C5, C3. What's very interesting, and I... Uh, and, uh, development lately is that nowadays literally all top players started playing the Alapin, starting from Carlsen, then you have Nepomniachtchi, then you even have Kramnik, who even though retired still plays online occasionally and uh, he plays the Alapin with white. So you'll be in good company if you if you join this pack. Uh, and um, but for me the the key here when studying the Alapin was actually not to go for the IQP lines that normally arise in the Alapin, but to avoid them and go for these lines that Tivyakov prefers. So I set up, set out to uh, see which lines can lead me there. So after c3, black has two main moves, which are knight f6 and d5. 
After knight f6, e5, knight d5, I start with the move knight f3. Now the main move is knight c6, even though d6 and e6 can both be played. So for example, after e6, I was checking knight a3, and you will see this line is uh, this move is actually quite critical and very very often employed in the lines I'm going to show you. But I also looked at the move g3, which pursues similar idea. Uh, white anticipates that black will play d6, those pawns will be exchanged. White will later on play d4, and the c5 and d4 pawns will be exchanged. This will lead white to the desire desirable a b c against a b position. Only that the bishop on g2 will be actually very well placed for further play on the queen side. So I also checked this. Yeah, but knight a3 uh, is another move I checked, and so now let's say d6. He takes d6, bishop d6, knight c4, attacking that bishop. Bishop drops back, d4, cd4, knight d4, and we have arrived at the uh, desired type of position. Three pawns against two on the queen side. Another move is the move, let's say, d6, and after d4, cd4, ed6 first, and now after, let's say, e6, knight d4, bishop d6, and again we have these three pawns against two. White can then combine ideas and even go for g3, the line that I mentioned, because the bishop on the long diagonal is actually quite efficient uh, and it supports white's queen side play. For example, knight c6, take on c6, castles, rook e1, and now even there is a concrete weakness that black has on the queen side. After knight f3, knight c6 is the main move, and now again knight a3. Tivyakov has played a lot of games with bishop c4, knight b6, bishop b3, but not always these, but yeah, sometimes these positions are also, can lead to, to the lines that uh, we are trying to, uh, to to get to, but I was curious about the move knight a3, actually. Uh, so now, this is quite original in a way, uh, and certainly not mainstream. Everybody's playing d4, bishop c3, and the lap in knight a3, not that many people. So again, you see this. There is this, um, you know, uh, element of your own theory. Yeah, but perhaps a small sideline where you have that you have explored and you you, you are comfortable employing. And also, the, when you explore such sidelines, you get uh, to to discover some more original ideas. So d6 now, bishop b5, for example, is interesting. Apart from e takes d6. So let's say bishop d7, e d6. A6 takes on c6, d4 takes, takes, and there we are. Queen d6, short castle, and knight c4 is coming. Yeah, oops, sorry. Uh, knight c4 is coming, attacking the queen, and at any point white wishes he can eliminate black's advantage of the bishop pair. After knight a3, there is also the move g6. This has been played by Fischer, and in fact, I remember the, the game Bisgar Fischer when I started exploring this line, and I was curious whether this is still good for and if it's good for white at all. In fact, in that game, black played the move g3, uh, and after bishop g7, bishop g2, knight c7, bishop basically equalized with d6. Uh, in fact, d6 after g3 is even stronger. So this wasn't all good for, for white as I hoped, it, perhaps it would, so I explored queen b3, an alternative. And here we have a completely different uh, type of position, but I also liked it, as it gives white the initiative. So let's say knight b6, d4, takes, takes, bishop g7, and now d5. Sacrificing a pawn for good development and black's king stuck in the center. So, looked promising enough. So more or less, this was the, the let's say, the outline of the repertoire that I looked at after knight f6. After d5, which is the other main move, ed5, queen d5, knight f3. Yeah. So, Black obviously has a choice, knight c6, bishop g4, g6, knight f6. Uh, and the only distinction that wasn't really leading me to the positions uh, of 3 versus 2 were the lines when Black developed the bishop on g4 and played knight c6. So for example, knight c6, knight a3, bishop g4, and now it's not so easy to push through d4, yeah, especially as Black can also cast along and put really serious pressure on the d file. So bishop e2, knight f6, d3 was also kind of acceptable for white knight comes to c4 and maybe at a later stage d4 will happen so not a 
typical variation, but also not a very common one yet, and probably would take black by surprise as they are expecting play in the center with d4. The move g6 is uh, a common move uh, played as it's considered as sort of a fighting option for black in the against the Alapin, and this uh, has been played qu uh, recently by the elite, for example, has been played by Carlsen several times, by Nakamura also. So knight a3, bishop g7, and now d4. This is better than what Carlsen played against Nico Georgiadis in build 2018, which was not that great. Yeah, d4 is much better. And now uh, cd4, knight b5. This is the idea of the move knight a3. So the threat is knight c7, obviously, forking pretty much everything that is to fork, and allowing for a capture on d4 with a piece. So knight a6, defending knight c7, and now either Carlsen's, Carlsen's preferred bishop e3, knight f6, bishop d4, which was also quite okay for him in the game against Giri, or the simple knight d4, simple development, yeah. Now rook e1 or bishop f4, which was played by Nakamura against Guseinov. In fact, Nakamura quite quickly won this game after rook e1, knight c5, bishop f1, knight e6, queen e2, knight h5, bishop e3, takes, takes, and now e5 was pretty horrible as knight b5. Again, that important square, and white was, white was already winning. So, going back to the position after knight f3, knight f6 is the common move, and now knight a3 again. So, ex except for the lines where bishop, black plays bishop g4, when white is forced to be more modest with d3, as I explained, d4 and knight long castle is pretty good for black. But after d3, rook d8, let's say knight c4, it's fine for, for white. Uh, for example, black cannot take the pawn on d3 because now his queen side is collapsing. Therefore, it's better to go to d7, and now bishop f4, queen b3, knight e5 can come at some yeah, uh, short castle, maybe rook d1, eventually, perhaps always d4, and obtaining the desired formation, pawn formation. Uh, if e6, which was played against Aronian, d4, a6, stopping knight b5, yeah, but allowing knight c4. Now, White targets another weak square. So knight bd7 and now simply bishop e2. a4 was also possible, yeah? So b5, knight e3 or knight a5 even. Yeah, a4 and white had the initiative. Very soon uh, it will be two against one. So a, b will happen and these two will be exchanged. So it will be b and c against b. And that b5 pawn is actually quite vulnerable. So again, we, had this, we have this comfortable middle game position. If in case of knight c6, bishop c4 first. It's also possible to play like Kramnik, bishop e2, let's say, e6, castles, bishop e7, d4, cd, knight b5, the same trick, threatening knight c7, and when the queen retreats, knight d4, knight d4, knight d4, and there we are. a2, b2, c3 against a7, b7. In addition to this, black also has problems with the uh, light squared bishop and the development, yeah. In fact, Kramnik also won this pretty fast after short castle bishop f4. Knight d5, uh, sorry, bishop d6 was played by Gukesh, but he missed that after bishop b5, queen e7, knight f5 is strong. After e5, bishop d6, white won the exchange and later the game. Uh, so this was Kramnik's move, bishop e2, but there is also bishop c4, queen d8, and d4, cd4, knight b5. Again, the same trick, this time dc3 is very dangerous because of bishop f4. And again, there is the problems with the c7 square. And if e5, knight e5, very strong initiative for white. Therefore, it's better to get rid of that knight, but now knight d4, knight d4, knight d4, and here we are again. a, b, c against a, b. So, uh, this was a brief overview. Obviously, the lines can and should be developed uh, at greater depth. But you see how fairly simple and uh, pretty straightforward it is to obtain the type of position you like in some cases. In this case, um, 
again to to revise the whole uh, process that i uh, went through was that i knew about tiviakov's openings but it was the so i knew about the player so it was the actually the book just literature that sparked the interest in me uh, about these positions and again thanks to the very good understanding i obtained by reading the book so it was uh, this process of understanding a type of position and you then you understand that they are to your liking and then finding lines and openings that can lead you to these positions and this was obviously uh, uh, made easier for me because i knew that there were already there was a player who was playing these lines in this case tiviakov and then just it was a matter of checking his openings ch checking his lines and then of course introducing my own ideas into them and thus you uh, in this way you have uh, your own new opening uh, repertoire or variation so i hope you enjoy this uh, mini series of ideas how to build an opening repertoire how to use ideas of other players ideas from books uh, ideas uh, that you improve on so well, i wish you good luck in creating your open repertoire and most first and foremost that this repertoire suits your style suits your needs suits your tastes i thank you for watching and i'll, I'll see you soon